started um, this week's session. Man they talks about so chapter chapter ten. They are cover all the things. So in chapter ten we mainly discussed the quantum mechanics for molecules and specifically for the simplest molecules, H2 plus. Okay. And starting from chapter eleven is actually the addition of chapter ten. I'll introduce you some qualitative theories about molecular orbital theory. So that's what we'll cover part of it in this section. Okay. Um, so the first one about Schrodinger equation, again, to set up the Schrodinger equation or to write or express the Hamiltonian operator in this chapter is also required. Okay, it's also required. For example, we can ask you to write out the Hamiltonian operator for this molecule in atomic units. Okay. This can be a question. So can you still remember? Uh, remember last time we talked about this? In order to construct the Hamiltonian operator, the first thing we need to do is to analyze what? What forces are acting? Instead of saying forces, it's better to use another. Energy, exactly, because Hamiltonian operator is a total energy operator talks about energy. So what forms of energy we have and how many terms can be included for each energy form. Right. For example, for this molecule, can you tell me what are those energy forms? The first thing, kinetic energy. energy, because it has one electron. And also for nuclei, the two, they also have for uh, kinetic energy. Okay, that's one thing. What else? Besides kinetic energy, we have a potential energy. And when we talk about potential energy, it actually can be classified into two groups, either by attraction or by repulsion. Right? By attraction, of course, we have one attraction here, a two attraction here. Do we have a repulsion energy? Where is it? Two nuclei. Okay. In this case, the repulsion is not due to the inter-electronic repulsion, it's due to the nuclear repulsion. So we know these are the two kinetic energy terms for the two nuclei in atomic units. Right? And we know we have kinetic energy for that single electron. Besides um, those kinetic energy, we have potential energy due to attraction. It's actually not in atomic units, sorry, it's not in atomic units. And uh, finally, the repulsion due to the two nuclei. Okay, that's how you construct the showing the, uh, sorry, the Hamiltonian operator. How about for hydrogen molecule? Again, we have kinetic energy, how many terms? How many terms of kinetic energy? Five. What are the five? Guess the number. Each particle in this system should have one kinetic energy, right? How many particles here? Four. four. So you have four terms. That's two terms for kinetic energy of the nuclei, again, two kinetic energy of the two electrons. Okay. And then what? Potential energy. Uh, potential energy is due to attraction. How many terms? I'll read the label in this figure. How many terms of potential energy due to attraction? Four. Mm -hmm. Five. Just one, right? Electron one, nuclear one, electron nuclear two, electron two, nuclear two, one, electron two, nuclear two. Now four terms. And each term you'll be able to write it this way. And that is negative, right? Okay, those are the attraction. And uh, do we have repulsion? How many terms? Think about that. We have two electrons. So each electron can repul repulse with each other. So we have one electron electron repulsion. But don't forget, we still have repulsion between two nuclei. So we have 
repulsion between two electrons, repulsion between two nuclei. And that's order having one number. Okay? Clear? And for some more complicated molecules, for example, lithium 2 or nitrogen oxygen, those things with more than one or two electrons, you better to use summation symbol to simplify your expression. Okay? So any questions? Again, this is required, and make sure you will be able to write whatever molecules we give to you. See how the atomic body operates. Okay. Usually, if we ask you to write the Schrodinger equation, simply you don't need to worry about what the wave function is. You can just use the sign there. Okay. But for Hamiltonian operator, we want you to express it explicitly. Okay. Like this way. Okay. And another thing is, if you convert this expression to atomic units. When we atomic units, we can set the mass of the electron to be zero. Right? Remember the definition of uh, S, uh, atomic units? I have lots of things equal to zero. One of them is the mass of the electrons. But we do not say the mass of the nuclei equals zero. Okay, so instead, after the the mass of the nuclei in Atomic units should be m divided by mass of the electron. So usually we need m prime to di distinguish this m with uh, the m here. So but in one word is please in one phrase is to say keep them, keep them. If we will ask you to write the Hamiltonian operator in atomic units, okay, you cannot assume that it equals one, but you can let this one equals one. Okay, any questions? Okay, if not, um, the great, very um, important concept introduced in chapter 10 is the born oppenheimer approximation. And in short, we call it BO approximation. Okay, it's important for you to understand the key concept of this one. So a BO approximation talks about the Hamiltonian operator of molecules. Okay. So it says the Hamiltonian operator can be separated into two parts. The one in blue we call the electronic part. The one in red we call the nuclear part. So we simply separate those terms we wrote before, right? We wrote before we have lots of things related to electron. We have some terms related to nucleus, uh, for our nuclei. So your approximation said you can split it, so you will get these two um, parts here. So for example, again, this one we wrote before, the uh, Hamiltonian operator for hydrogen molecule. And we know uh, here, the kinetic energies, the okay, kinetic energies of the, and it's not nor, you know, so this is another thing. So here, the nuclear part, right? Now here is the electron, electronic part, but actually we have one term that's due to the nuclear nuclear repulsion. It's also related to nucleus, but usually when we do the treatment, we just keep this one. Okay. And we group this one into the electronic part. This is the one first thing. And the second thing is after we can ignore the kinetic energy of the two nuclei. Okay, somebody if you use born Oppenheimer approximation and you write the Hamiltonian operator, this first two terms you can throw them away. Okay, we simply assume the two nuclei, or the nuclei there are just fixed. The positions are fixed. So there's no kinetic energy for them. Okay? Um, so the wave function, we talk about the Hamiltonian operator, so we can solve the energy actually. So uh, also the wave function, the wave function again, composed of the two parts and you time them together. It's like what we talked about in chapter three. For piping the box theory, we have from different dimensions. Okay, just time to take it. A question? Yeah, so uh, we ignore the k terms of the nuclei because they're assumed to be stationary or? Stationary. Okay. Like, uh, assumed to be uh, fixed there because their motion, their velocity is compared to electrons are pretty, pretty small. Okay. So and you can treat them as a fixed there. That's including, like in this, heteronuclear uh, atoms or. Is that for any sort of molecule? For any, for any molecule. So we assume it's fixed. 
the nuclei are fixed, all of them, okay? Uh, so the wave function composed of the two times together. So Schrodinger equation now, you can construct Schrodinger equation also from two parts. The one in blue is the kinetic part. And then you need to use, you need to use the inner to solve from the first equation and plug it into the second equation related to the nuclear part and get the total energy. Okay, so the total energy composed of two things. The energy from the electronic part and the energy from nuclear part. And that's actually the key idea for Warren Oppenheimer approach machine. Okay, sort of like separation of the energies. Okay, so any questions? But this key concept you need to be able to know, okay? When not ask you to, you know, carry out the calculations specifically, but there's one example in the textbook, you better read them, go through it, and understand the key concept, okay? For example, we have a question actually from last year's final, also about it. It's pretty long, but it's straightforward. So give you some time and please tell me your thoughts. are true. Right, we're not asking you to find all true or false, but we ask you which one we need you to avoid on the hammer approach me. And what choose D? And what choose D? And what choose E? Then which one you choose? <laughs>
molecular orbitals, so usually uh, in short MO, the number of molecular orbitals should be the same as the number of atomic orbitals you use to construct the molecular orbitals. For example, if you choose three atomic orbitals and linearly combine them, you will end up with three molecular orbitals. So the number should be conserved. Okay. Um, so the wave function of hydrogen um, two plus, actually we have two nuclei, so usually we use two atomic wave functions to write down the molecular orbitals. So here one S A is we use the one S wave function of a hydrogen atom A. Okay. Uh, one S orbital from hydrogen atom B, because we have two hydrogen atoms into the in the molecule, so we label one is A, one is B. So you see they linearly combine together and with this coefficient here. Okay, so here C1 equals C2 equals this. And based on this expression after we can give you the question to ask you to evaluate the probability for the electron that be found in you know, near nuclear A and near nuclear B. Right? Based on this expression you will see after you have an equal chance to find the electrons at the two ends because they have the same coefficient. Okay. Sort of give you the idea that we can make you a question like this to incorporate some concept from previous chapters and the later chapters. So for one question, you may have more. More than you know, you know, the points can be from, can from uh, many chapters they incorporate together. Okay. So the question you will see in fact. So uh, let's see the bonding orbitals. So for bonding orbitals, we have a subscript means plus. So later on, we expand plus after it has some physical meaning. Okay. For anti-bonding orbitals, you use minus. So you get this expression. But again, you still use linear combination of atomic units, atomic units to form molecular, um, sorry, for, uh, use atomic orbitals or wave functions to form molecular wave functions. So the general idea of the picture shows you the, the physical meaning of these two expressions. So for this one, the plus means one S A plus one S B means the two wave functions, they constructively overlap. Okay, and then they will merge into one molecular orbital. That is the, the side plus. Okay. And for side minus, anti-bounding orbitals means one S A minus one S B, so actually they have destructive overlap together. So they end up with repel with each other and form this anti-bond. Okay, and this anti-bond here can be described by <coughs> this equation. Okay, there's only one word, uh, one parameter I didn't expand, that is S. S is called the overlap integral, and uh, let's talk about it later when we talk about energy. So here, I want to ask you any questions for this part. Okay. If not, I'll be talking about energies. Uh, is that, are you sure that that's supposed to be, uh, for the antibody orbital, it's supposed to be 1 over square root of 2 times 1 minus? 1 minus. Okay. 1 minus. In so our textbook, they use plus minus here, plus minus here. Okay. If we use minus, you can minus everywhere where it is okay. plus minus. Uh, the energies of H2 plus molecules, um, again, I skipped all the evaluation. Okay, are not required for you to carry out the, you know, the energy, to evaluate energy step by step, okay, especially for the later chapters. Um, for this one, bonding orbitals, the energy is that, anti bonding orbitals like this, and I need to explain a lot of parameters inside. So the first thing is HAA. Here, HAA is called the atomic integral. So use Dirac notation. Can you read Dirac notation? Can you read that? Let's talk about the energy from 1SA and 1SA. That's the atomic orbitals for hydrogen atom A. So there, that average energy for hydrogen atom A is defined as HAA. This is called an atomic integral. And E equals HAB. Because we just assume one is A, one is B, but in fact, the two nuclei are indistinguishable. So it should be the same. So that's why HAA is HAB. 
And we actually used this conclusion here to simplify this expression. And HAB here is called the exchange integral. So this one is not actually, it's not the average energy for a simple or either hydrogen atom. It's the average energy sort of considered about the two atoms together. Okay. So we call this one an exchange integral because you can exchange A here, A to B to get this one. And also you can change that to HBA, that will still be the same as HAB. Again, the reason is the two nuclei are indistinguishable. Okay. And the last one S, is what I mentioned before, is called the overlap integral. For this one, it's not energy actually. It's just in the over describe the overlap of the two wave functions together. Okay. So you calculate this. So it's sort of like it looks like a orthogonal, right? When we approve orthogonality, we integral the two wave functions together. But right here, it might give you zero, might give you one, might give you something between zero and one. Okay. So um, one more thing about overlap integral. This one is actually this two still are important. But compared with this one, I want to say more about this because this one is more important. It actually tells you why chemical bond can be formed. Okay. As I mentioned uh, from your textbook, so this. Um, Overlap integral can be further derived to a, a function related to the inter-nuclear distance r, or the abundance r. Okay. The exact mathematical relationship is as simple as this. And you can plot the s function against the r. And you get this value here. But from the first you know, glance of this picture, we will see s is actually between 0 and 1. Right, the maximum is one, the minimum is zero. So then what's the physical meaning then? I say this is the overlap integral. So of course it talks about the two wave functions, one SA, one SB, how they overlap with each other. For example, if they do not overlap with each other like this, S is zero. So sort of like point here. If the two nuclei, if the two nuclei are too far away, so they cannot overlap. The wave function cannot overlap, so s equals zero. Or they can be partially, you know, partially overlap with each other. In that case, s will be a number between. So actually, cannot be cannot be equal. It's just a number between zero and one without zero or one. Okay. Situation two. Situation three is the two completely overlap together. S will be one. Okay, S O be one. So my question is for you know when you want to form chemical bond, which section do you think is the best situation? If the two wave functions can be linearly overlap, sorry, linearly combined and form molecular orbitals or form the chemical bond, which situation would be the perfect one? The second one. Okay. Because for the first one, the two they do not overlap, they do not interact, they're just two separated atoms. For this one, well, it's perfect regarding the energy. Okay, it's perfect regarding the energy. But you know, the two you cannot bring the two nuclei and touch with each other. Right, that's impossible. They have a pretty strong repulsion. So here I say this one related to energy as naturally. So how can they be related to energy? So still remember this expression for bonding orbital energy. Right, bonding orbital energy. Now look at this. My question is, if S increases, how will energy change? Energy decreases. Good or bad? Good or bad for the molecules? The molecule wants to be higher energy or wants to be in lower energy? Of course, it wants to be lower energy because that's stable. Right, think about that, that's stable. So that's why later they will lead to another conclusion that we'll talk about later. Well, right before. So we'll talk about how the two atomic wave functions they overlap. They tend to overlap at the maximum areas. So they want to make the area here maximum. Because we know we want to make the S maximum, so we'll make the inner minimum. 
So that covers how the two wave functions they overlap with each other. Okay, but here I want to give you the uh, idea is S is related to energy. And the more you overlap, the less energy you will have. And the more stable the molecule is. Okay, so the molecules they want to be like in lecture, the professor said we want to be significantly overlap with each other because it can significantly lower the energy and significantly increase the stability. Okay? So any questions? Energy of like energy of bonding energy or energy of, of the total molecule. Okay. And we always talk about total energy that comes from Schrodinger equation where you we use Hamiltonian of um, so based on the energy actually we can draw the energy diagram. Okay, also to the third high E. So third high E is the energy I showed before, that energy minus the energy of the proton. Okay, or a hydrogen atom, so a hydrogen atom, and you get the IE. And we plot the IE versus the internuclear separation, that is the capital letter R. Okay. And for ground state, you will get the curve like that. Okay. <coughs> and we'll find there's a minimum point, minimum point. And you can read the x-axis, which will give you the small letter R. And that's actually the small letter R for the two hydrogen nuclei. So what's the name for small letter R here? What's the distance between two nuclei? The what? Is there a distance between the two yeah, nuclei? The distance between the two nuclei is called what? Chapter 6. When we talk about radio rotator, we say B contains what? Rotational spectroscopy can tell you what? Bound lens. That, that's a bound lens. Okay, so bound lens, where is, where is it? It's here, from the minimum point. Okay, you can read it. So ground state has one minimum point, so that be stable. So that's why for most of the molecules, they want to be stable. They want to stay in the ground state, and specifically, they want to stay at this point. That corresponds to a bond list. And usually, you know, usually we just call bond list, bond list. But for some textbooks, or if we want to be more uh, accurate, we use equilibrium bond list. Okay. Uh, so any questions about the previous part? Okay, if not, we'll go to chapter 11 and uh, thoroughly talk about the molecular orbital theory. Okay. Uh, Again, this is the concept, the, the conclusion I talked about before. Chemical bond form due to the overlap of atomic wave function. And after they have one we're supposed to overlap. Like this. So first of all, I want you to be clear about this picture. So what does that mean? So here, this nuclear and plus, this one, this is one atomic orbital. Okay, this is one atomic orbital. This is another atomic orbital. Okay, based on the shape, can you tell me what's the uh, atomic molecule for, oh, sorry, an atomic orbital for this, for this part, for this two? SPDF, which one? Mm -hmm. There has only one angular node. L equals one, so it's a uh, P orbital, okay? So this is the P orbital. This is what orbital? It's spherical. Yes. S orbital. Yeah. So here it talks about the P orbital overlap with S orbital, and they examine that from different atoms, okay. or maybe from one atom or from, or from the, the same kind of atom or from different kinds of atoms, but right? just from two atoms. So the, this can be the nuclei here, the nucleus here, this can be the nucleus here. They overlap. Right, so sort of same thing for here. This is just also P orbitals, but with different orientations. So we know orientation of the orbital is discovered by ML value. So simply means ML is different, but it's still P orbitals. P orbitals, P orbitals, and S orbitals. So they have this kind of ways to overlap. Okay. Can you guess which one or which ones can give you the stable chemical bond? Well, the hint is what I mentioned before. In order to overlap, 
the two atoms the, or the wave functions, they want to be significantly overlap, you know, to increase the maximum overlap area in order to be stable. So this one for a mechanical bond. Okay, this one for a mechanical bond. No. Why not? Because there's no overlap between the There's all. This, this is the whole. This is the whole wave function. They overlap to here. So yes. That's one no. Yes, right. How about this? Well, here is from this direction. Here is from this direction. And this one also form a chemical bond? Why not? Anti-bonding? If you say anti-bonding, oh, yeah, already forming a chemical bond. Oh, I say. Anti-bonding is another kind of chemical bond. Right here, we'll talk about whether you can form a chemical bond or not. If you say anti-bonding, you just say yes, right? Any other questions? Any other opinions? Well, the negative charge and positive charge, does that cancel out? Exactly, they cancel out. So S will be what? Zero. Zero. No overlap. No chemical bond. So, no Okay. That's why, based on the two situations you will see, actually, the overlap, they have some certain preferred direction. It's not from everywhere. At least if you're from here, the two parts cancel out, the S will be zero. So only from here, this axis, you get the overlap. But we can still have another situation, which is not just strictly, you know, strictly overlapping in this way, but I guess it has some angle, like overlapping in this way. Do you think it can form a chemical bond? Why not? It doesn't. Well, the picture I did not draw quite well, but uh, think about it. If we have the, like the, use this one as the center, and we rotate the circle here, at which position will give you the maximum overlap? Before, the first one that you went over is the most stable, but there's the most overlap in the direction of the Exactly. Okay. So the, Key part is here. So here it can also overlap, but the, this the area is not the maximum. Because if you use this at the center, you rotate the circle, you rotate it here. So actually, the maximum area should be when the circle, the center of this one is on the same line with this two. Can you imagine the picture? You can just try to like rotate it a little bit. So only when at the same level they can have. You know, can they have the maximum overlap there? Okay. So this can still not give you the stable chemical bond. Okay. How about the last one? Can the last one give you chemical bond? Why not? You think plus is negative, or plus minus, and they will cancel out, right? Well, this situation they cancel out because positive overlap with positive is positive, positive overlap with negative is negative. So these two parts they cancel out. But this, you have only negative part here. There's no positive part for you to cancel out that area, right? So this can also give you the chemical bond. But then what's the difference between this situation and this situation? Not in the second one anti-bond or anti This is good. This is anti-bond. This is bond. Okay. Again, constructive overlap give you bonding. Destructive overlap give you anti-bonding. And zero overlap does not give you chemical bond. Not the maximum overlap can still not give you the chemical bond. Okay. So we'll talk about more. Okay. According to you know, how atomic orbitals they overlap, we can classify chemical bond into several groups. And I bet you have heard this from your old chem class 
So they are Sekhmaban, Haiman, Merhaban. Right? At least from the O camp, you know, you learn Sekhmaban and then Haiman. So in order to form Sekhmaban, here I say head to head. It's just a descriptive way for you to understand. So it's like the wave function, the head to head they form it. So we'll give you, I'll give you the example. Okay? For pi bound, it's shoulder by shoulder. Okay? For sigma bound, for delta bound, it's face to face. For delta bound, we're not required to understand that. Okay? So we only talk about sigma bound and pi bound. Okay? For delta bound, they're usually in the complex. So when you are the chem 151A, the in, advanced in, in organic chemistry, you probably will talk about this. Okay? But not for this class. So again, um, sigma bound, head to head, what does that mean? So the very uh, easy um, example is 1s with 1s, they overlap. So because 1s and 1s, they are spherical, so there's actually no head anyway. So this overlap is, um, and this is positive, this is positive. They can merge together and form the bond, and we call this a constructive overlap, gives you bond. Okay. So what is destructive overlap here? So if you have a plus one, you have a negative. Okay, positive and negative, so they repel. And that gives you one node. This is called destructive overlap, and that will give you the anti -bond. Okay. Um, so another example is for P orbitals. For example, I have two orbitals. How can the two orbitals form sigma bond? How can the two orbitals form sigma bond? I mean, sigma bond is head to head, right? So where's the head of this orbital, do you think? So actually, this is the head, right? Or from uh, that will stick out the direction, I mean, the head. So head to head, what does that mean? You can use this one to overlap here. Okay, that is something like that. So this two, you bring them together, head to head. And don't forget, you can also use this one to overlap to here. That is, right? Bring them together, they will give you one one. Also sigma bond, but it's a sigma anti bond. Okay. So if you draw the picture, this one will give you something like that. Okay, this repel with each other. Um, let's draw that. Somehow a graph. Sorry. So this is the idea of head to head. It's a descriptive language. But understand this one? Can you bring the two of this? That's not head to head. That's actually the deep, the second situation. That's shoulder by shoulder. Okay. Um, this is descriptive language to describe what is what are can, a sigma bonds. Or they have a more formal definition that deals with the symmetry. Okay. For example, if we pick the sigma bond here, and we define the internuclear axis to go through the two nuclei, and we rotate 180 degrees for this orbital, and we will find actually the orbital, the wave function, is still the same as before, right? The all positive everywhere, so once you rotate, well, that kind of angle is still the same. So we say the symmetry or the phase does not change. Okay, so this is the definition for sigma bond. That is, if you rotate the orbital through, you know, by the internuclear axis, if the phase does not change, they are sigma bond or antibond, whatever. Okay. For example, here we use the internuclear uh, axis here and rotate 180 degrees. The phase also does not change for the two parts, right? Sigma bond. Here, internuclear axis rotate 180 degrees. Again, phase does not change. 
Sigma bound. Sigma bound. Okay? Get an idea? Next one, high bound, shoulder by shoulder. So the concept is like you bring the two like this together. Okay? And it can also form this one, the bound. That is constructive overlap. So the one in red is positive, one in, in white is negative. You bring the two this way together, so the head to head, the shoulder here, there's the upper shoulder overlap, the lower shoulder overlap. We'll form a picture like that. So this is constructive overlap, and we call this one high bond. And also you can have destructive overlap, that would give you high anthony bond. And the interesting thing is, for high bond, you actually have one node. For high antibody, you have two nodes here. Good idea? How many nodes for sigma bond? How many nodes for sigma bond? Do you remember? There's no node, actually. There's no. Okay. How many nodes for sigma uh, antibody? This is one. So here, for pi bond, we have one node. Pi and pi bond are two nodes. OK, and again, shoulder by shoulder is just a descriptive language. We have a formal de definition for pi bond. That is, again, you find the intranuclear axis, and you rotate 180 degrees. This time, does the phase change? Does the phase change? The red one back here, the white one back here. They can switch the position. Phase does change. How about this? Rotate 180 degrees. It rotate it, rotate it. Well, change, right? Exactly, positive change to negative, negative changes to positive. So phase does change. This is a formal definition of high bound. Okay. And your question, your homework programs, one question gives you one molecular orbital picture and ask you to choose what kind of orbital this is. The first thing is you need to be clear whether this is high bound or sigma bound. How can you know? It's by doing this. Rotate 180 degrees and find whether the phase tends or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is a well, previous slide, two slides talks about the formal definition of sigma bonds and high bonds. And we have one more thing is to assign the symmetry for the four kinds of bonds. Okay. So here the notation G means the asymmetry above the inversion center. The U is the anti-symmetry above the inversion center. So the meaning is, so we have four. So sigma bond, sigma anti bond. Pi bond, pi anti bond. And when you find the Inversion center, right? Inversion center, again, it's pretty easy to find. It's just the center of the molecule. So the center of the molecule is here, center of the molecule is here, center of the molecule is here, center of the molecule is here. It's just to the center of the two nuclei. Okay, for that atomic molecule, it's always like this. Okay. So based on the definition, can you tell me, is this a G or U for sigma bond? Can you do inversion? Can you understand the meaning of inversion? So you have something, you have an inversion center. Inversion means that you find any point here, and you invert it like a mirror, and you have a mirror point here. Okay, that's called the inversion. You have an idea? You understand the inversion? Okay. So based on this, if we call symmetry, that means the phase does not change once you, after inversion. We call anti-symmetry means the phase does change after Inversion. Okay? So based on this, is this G or U? G. G. G, right? Positive to positive. So keep in mind, all the things, the shading area is positive. So it's positive to positive, positive to positive. It's G. And then what's this? So that's why we find a point right here, right? It's positive. After inversion, it's here as negative. So the phase does change. So that's Anti-symmetry, that's you. Okay. How about this? G or U? U. U. Okay. For example, find a point here, 
after inversion is going to hear, phrase does change. How about this? G, right? So you find something interesting? For sigma bound is G. But pi antibound, antibound is G. For sigma antibound is U. But for pi bound is G. Sorry, is U. Okay. We use this, we use this later in order to write out the electron, the electron configuration of a certain molecule. Okay, when you assign GU for some homonuclear diatomic molecules in this class. And hopefully you understand the meaning of this. Okay, any questions? And again, from the homo sperms, this that question give you a picture, the second step, after you figure out whether it's the sigma or pi, the second step is to assign G or U. Okay. Um, based on the same way we introduced it before, uh, we can construct the molecular energy level diagram. And uh, this actually has been introduced in chem one b So all the things we're doing here is just a review. Okay. Hopefully it's a review, not a preview. Okay. Um, Recall from Ken 1B, uh, why is the molecular energy diagram, level diagram? Well, it, it's just a diagram which shows you how molecular orbitals are formed from different atomic orbitals and shows the order of all the molecular orbitals based on the energy. Okay. Do you have the picture now? Can you recall from 1B? So if not, one example for nitrogen gas. Okay. We bring two nitrogen atoms together and the atomic orbitals overlap to somehow they form the molecular orbitals and they form nitrogen molecule, okay, nitrogen two. So this is the nitrogen um, atom, the electron configuration. It has seven electrons. Okay, one S two P, one S two S two P, again one S two S to P, they have the exactly the same energy levels because they are the same all atom. Okay? And we can bring them together and they overlap with each other and form the molecular bond. And another principle for overlapping, you know, besides what we talked about before, the maximum overlap and uh, what else? Maximum overlap and some of some other sort of points. And one more thing is they should have similar energy. So the energy is comparable for them to overlap. Okay. So if we have one S orbital here, one S orbital here for sure, the two they overlap. So they interact. And once they interact, they give you the bond and anti-bond. And then you can assign electrons into them. Okay. Same thing for two S. Okay, for the two. And here, 2p is somewhat a little bit different. So the first thing is it forms, it's a little bit weird, anyway, uh, it forms like this. Okay. And from this diagram, we actually can check the idea. I say the number of molecular orbitals should be the same as the number of atomic orbitals used to overlap. 2, 2, 2, 2. 2, 2, 2, 2. two. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are three, five, three, and six. So it satisfies the mechanism. Okay. And then you can assign inner, assign electrons from the lower one to the higher one. Okay. And this is not enough for a diagram. For a diagram, we usually will give a name for each orbital. As I mentioned, this one, what S overlap with S will give you sigma bond. And the one with lower energy is bond. So this is sigma bond, actually. And sigma bond, the symmetry notation is G or U. Sigma bond. G or U. G or U. G. G, okay. So yeah, actually, you can give a name as sigma G. But here, um, in order to distinguish this one with this one, this one is also a sigma G. We call it sigma G1S. So that means this sigma orbital is from two 1S orbitals. Okay. So for this one is sigma antibond. So sigma U, the notation, symmetry U, 1S. 
Okay. So two sigma g two s sigma u two s. Those are the, the the first four. And from the p orbitals, it's a little bit different. Okay. The first two they degenerate. Okay. Those, well, those are sigma. Okay. Sorry, this two. Sorry, this two. This two. Not this two. Okay, this two. Yeah, that's fine. Makes sense. So here is sigma bond. And sigma bond and sigma g. They're coming from two pz orbitals. Okay, from PZ. So that's because we usually define the internuclear uh, axis is the Z axis. So why Px cannot form the sigma bond? Why Py? Only Tz. This is because, so if you go back to check your chapter 7, you will find only Pz, the head of the Pz is on this axis. Okay, so another one, Pz. And you bring the two head to head along Z axis. So then they form a sigma bond. Okay. If you bring a, if you bring a, a, a Px or Py or another, their orientation is like this. Okay. You bring the two together, they form shoulder by shoulder, they form high bond. Can you understand that one? So usually we just say the sigma is from two Pz orbitals. And what I mentioned here is other orbitals, they form high bond. And pay attention, pi here always the bonding, the bond is always, the energy is always lower than anti bond. So the lower one, pi, must be pi bond. And what's the symmetry notation for pi bond? U or T? U. Okay. Let's say if sigma bond is G, the pi bond should be U. They have the same notation, they have the different notations. So pi u from 2px, pi u from 2py. Whatever you want to assign, this is y or x, this is x or y, doesn't matter because they degenerate. And for this anti-bond, it's pi g. Okay. Get it? So that's actually the molecular energy level diagram we want you to join the homework and also for the final exam. Okay. Show how the atomic orbitals interact with form molecular orbitals. And label each molecular orbitals. Okay, and based on this figure, actually, we can calculate. Uh, again, uh, uh, what we're saying is uh, this situation only applies for nitrogen or the elements before nitrogen. Okay, it looks like this. Molecular orbital looks like this. And from this molecular orbital diagram, we can actually calculate bond order. And you still remember how can we evaluate bond order based on this figure? Bond order equals what? Um, I guarantee this will be one question in your final exam. Guarantee. Um, is it bonding minus anti-bonding? What bonding minus oh. anti-bonding? So if you just say bonding, that's orbital. What can orbital minus? It should be some number. One half what? Um, one half times bond order minus. Bond order. Where does it value bond order? Bond orbital. Bond orbital? You mean number of bond orbitals? Number of electrons in bond orbitals. That's what I'm here. Number of electrons in bond in bonding orbitals minus number of electrons in anti-bonding orbitals. Divided by two. And tell me what's the bond order here. It's not hard. You don't even care about this because the two in the bonding orbital, two in the anti-bonding orbital, they cancel out. This one, they cancel out. The only thing you care about here. So how many electrons in bonding orbital? Where are the 10? <laughs> um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This two, they, this is anti-bond, this is bond, this is anti-bond, this is bond. So let's say if we cancel out this, right? They cancel out. How many electrons in bonding orbitals? Six. How many electrons in anti-bonding orbitals? 
No, zero. So six minus zero divided by two. Three. Make sense? Think about nitrogen. The bond order between two nitrogen atoms is a triple bond. A triple bond, bond order equals three. So regarding the valence uh, electrons? Valence electrons, exactly. Valence electrons. Or you can also do this. You calculate all the numbers from all bonding orbitals and minus the number of uh, electrons in all anti-bonding orbitals. They'll be the same. If you don't believe, let's do it. So if we count all the numbers of electrons in the bonding orbital, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 6. That would be 11, right? And minus the electrons in four anti-bonding orbitals would be 2 plus 4. And then what else? Uh, I must make a mistake. So 2, 2, 4. 4 plus 6 is 10. Minus four, uh, 2 plus 2 is 4. 6 divided by 2 also 3. So that matter, right? Well, for me personally, I just count the balance here. I know this must be canceled. Okay. And there's no unpaired electrons, right? I recall from the chem one b There's no unpaired electrons, so this is a one more impaired regarding the magnetic property. Is this is this molecule magnetic or not? It's not. So we call it a uh, Dow magnetic molecule. So similarly, this molecule is not magnetic. So this picture is showing you, you cannot confine the nitrogen, the liquid nitrogen between the two um, poles or in the magnetic field. It's not magnetic, so you cannot hold it. So they evaporate. Okay. This situation, well, similarly, you can also construct the molecular orbitals like what I did before, but this situation applies to oxygen and ox elements after oxygen. So if you have, like, we'll talk about two like, diatomic molecules, right? So if you have a molecule, sorry, if you have a one atom which is oxygen or the element after oxygen in the periodic table, their energy background looks like this. Do you find the difference? You have a difference? So this second here is a chance. See that? So before, it's like this. Now it becomes here. So only this part, actually only this part changes. This is due to the SP mixing. Okay, it's like the, the S orbital and the D orbital so they interact. So here I didn't show this exactly. This should, this S orbital should contribute here and contribute here, contribute here, contribute here as well. So this is due to the you know, before situation is there's only three p, the three p orbital they interact and they form the set of orbital here. But now for oxygen, because the two s and two p energy difference is not quite large, so they actually two s can interact with two p, two s can interact with two p, and they kind of mixing together. I'll give you this panel. Oh, this is the first thing. And the second thing, again, bound order. Can you tell me what's the bound order? For here, oxygen molecule. Two. Two. It makes sense, right? Because oxygen, oxygen, double bond. Okay. And um, again, I want, I want to emphasize when you draw the energy diagram, your two sides here and here, they are atomic molecules. Okay. And in the middle is the molecular orbitals. Okay, that's how you read the diagram. Regarding magnetic property, this molecule has the unpaired electrons, right? So this is called paramagnetic molecules. In this case, you can actually confine the liquid oxygen in the magnetic field. Okay, because liquid oxygen is magnetic. Okay, that make sense? Okay. All those things I talked about could be possible to be questions in the final class to you to do. I understand how to figure out the bond order by the Lewis structure, but can mm -hmm. you explain again how to do it by um, leading the molecular orbital diagram? How to do this one? Yeah, how to lead it by, um, yeah, to. Well, how, how, why is it switched, right? 
Or how you draw the molecular order, which? Um, how to figure out the bond order. The bond order? By, by using the molecular The molecular orbitals? Yeah. You just need to count the number of electrons in bonding orbitals, right? So, the number, so all those things, they cancel out. Because we have two in the bonding orbital, we have two in the anti-bonding orbital. The two minus two, they cancel out. So I do not need to care about the complete field field shell. Complete field field shell, I don't need to come, like, think about that. I only care about valence shell. So the valence shell, that's here. And we know this three orbitals are bonding orbitals. These three orbitals are anti-bonding orbitals. Because the energy of anti-bonding orbitals are higher than the energy of uh, bonding orbitals. So then this three must be at bonding orbitals. So there are six electrons. The three are anti-bonding orbitals. There are two electrons. So six minus two divided by two, that's two. Okay. And these two are unpaired electrons. So the molecule is magnetic. Okay, so this actually proved the experimental observation proved the quantum mechanics here is valid. Okay. Um, this shows you the more, um, not more, uh, most of the bad atomic molecules in this uh, second period, in the periodic table, listen to vermin 2 until uh, fluoride 2, the fluorine gas. You will see that only the interact, the overlap, or like switch the position is from nitrogen oxygen. So that's why I say if we write the uh, molecular orbitals, that involves all the atoms or elements, including nitrogen, or before nitrogen, they all have this pattern, okay? This sigma orbital is above high orbitals. But when you are close this boundary, you want to oxygen or element after oxygen, the sigma bond actually has lower energy than the two high bonding orbitals, okay? This is due to SP mixing, and also expand, okay? Any questions about this? So refer to this figure at UOC, okay? Um, based on the molecular energy level diagram I have constructed before, you can actually give the electron configuration of the molecules. And you simply draw the one, like sigma G1s, this super square two means we have two electrons. And sigma U1s in the anti-bonding has two electrons. And you do it like this, right? Or you can use just one sigma g. If you don't want to write one s, you label it as one sigma g. That means the first sigma g in the orbitals that must from two one s orbitals. Okay, that equivalent. For oxygen, you can also do this, right? Or you can simplify it. And all we can further simplify your um, ex, uh, this configuration is because this is the the one subshell. The subshell number one is completely filled, so we use kk to like shorten it. So you can use KK and then write this. Okay. Or just write them as a whole if you think this is more straightforward. It will give you plenty of space for you to write. Okay. If you want to write all the things like this line, it will give you plenty of space. Okay, um, any questions? If not, um, for the intro that I'm talking more here, so it's somewhat different. Okay. For the intro, what did we talk about before? They're all homo nuclear atomic molecules. For the intro one, well, if you just don't understand, that's okay. Um, just understand the concept. So we they say the hydrogen fluoride molecules. So we have a hydrogen which has only one, like shown here, the electron just in one S orbitals. I mean for bond state. And for fluorine, its configuration is like this. And this, they have, they're not at the same level, okay? Because they have different energy, the orbital energies. And usually, when the hydrogen form bond with other atoms, <coughs> other atoms will use the outermost of the electron shell to form the bond with hydrogen. And we know for fluorine, fluoride here, they will use two p orbitals, I mean the valence shell, to form the bond with hydrogen. Okay? And from this, you will get, you will see actually, they, they interact and give some bonding orbitals, anti-bonding orbitals, there's something here, I will say, okay? So they use F hydrogen 1s, interact with fluoride, uh, fluorine 2 PZ, they'll give you sigma orbitals here. Okay. And when you label it, label here, it's no G or U notation. 
back once. So we get up here, I showed you the picture. The bounty all we know is looks like this. Is there any inversion center here? One is bigger, one is smaller. Any inversion center? No. No inversion center, no GU. So that's flat. For pendulum diatomic molecules, when you label the energy levels, you never use G or U. Okay. Instead, so if you want to say this is a sigma bound, use one sigma. Or sigma, I just use one sigma. Or anti bound, one sigma star. That's why you're using one and one B. Okay. Instead of use G and U to distinguish the bounding orbital or anti bounding orbital. Okay. This is called bound, anti bound. Okay, one, we don't know. And the whole of those things are called the non bound. It is not from the bound. This is because this um, S orbitals, the inner compared with this one, they have a huge difference. So I said the overlap requires that two atomic orbitals have similar energies. But here it's not, so they do not interact. And here, this two uh, PXPY, simply because they cannot form the overlap. And once they overlap, they cancel off. Okay. So the symmetry, the orientation is not suitable for overlapping. So that's why they still remains here. Okay. And you can practice for other control uh, nuclear atomic molecules. And in your homework, we have the cyanide and ions. But also, you can practice carbon monoxide. Okay. Uh, more to inner diagram, the bound order something. So if bound order increases, bound inner will increase or decrease. Which one is stronger? Triple bound is stronger, or double bound is stronger, or single bound is stronger? Triple bound. Triple bound. So stronger means higher energy, right? How about bound n? Or equilibrium bound n? Okay. The stronger bond, the more the closer the two atoms will be together, right? Because they have more overlap. Okay. So the relationship like this figure shows. So this is bond order, bond energy, bond X. So bond energy is directly proportional to bond order, while bond length or equilibrium bond length is inversely proportional to bond order. Uh, molecular term symbol, we haven't covered in this uh, in the lecture, so here I just you know, briefly give you the idea. You can just, after the lecture, just go back and review this slide. So it involves several um, elements. So 2s plus 1 spin multiplicity, and L and G and U notation and plus minus notation. Okay. So you first need to determine ML and then determine S, determine G and U. Okay. G and U is the orbitals. Things stuff that we already talked about, and then finally determine class and minus. So, so we haven't talked about this, I just you know, skip this part. And you just go back and check this after Friday lectures. Okay? So any questions? No, we're done here. And then any questions from Kramer's part? Okay, if not, we well, left the only one thing in chapter 11, that is the Hacker model or Hacker molecular orbital theory. Okay, and we will talk about in the day after tomorrow, in the Wednesday lecture, I'll talk about this part, and I'll skip this one, it's pretty easy. So finally, bring this question again from the first section. And now, if I ask you to fill in one word to complete this sentence, what word do you want to hear? Still hard. <laughs> <laughs> Still challenging. Well, you may have a lot of emotions and uh, your reference, right? Compare the word you choose in the beginning and compare the word now. Hopefully, you will feel better after all the things. And with that, that's the end of this section and also the end of the whole Kim 63 day section in this quarter. And I really thank you. For